Woodstock are Luke Horo, Gregory D.S. Anderson, and Opino Gomango from the Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages and Centurion University. And the title of this presentation is Acoustic Phonetic Properties of P Words and G Words in Sora Verbal Forms. Great, thank you very much. So uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the ongoing work we've been doing over the last few years on trying to understand the uh, internet, intonational and prosodic properties of words and phrases in Sora, which is a Munda language spoken in India. So Lem Ben first, hello, I bow to you all. So this is what we're gonna talk about. First, we're just gonna briefly introduce um, Sora and the topic and specifically about Sora vowels and prominence and disyllables. And then a little bit about the concept of P or prosodic or phonological words and G or grammatical words. And then specifically looking at some data in Sora nominal forms, the three and four syllable forms, and then in some three and four syllable verb forms, uh, and then we'll summarize. Okay, so Sora is a Munda language spoken by roughly 400,000 people, mainly in Southern Odisha and adjacent parts of Northern Andhra Pradesh um, in central India. Also, there are Sora populations found in various tea garden areas, um, Assam, West Bengal, Tripura, also in Bangladesh. And uh, those date to fairly recently within the last 200 years. Um, so morphologically, Sora can be described as mildly polysynthetic and agglutinative in terms of its grammatical word structure. However, we know that uh, from the literature that mismatches in P words and G word structure is common in polysynthetic languages. Uh, but up until quite recently when our team undertook this, uh, G words have not been analyzed phonoprosodically in Sora at all. Uh, but this process is currently underway. So just to give you an idea of what area we're talking about, this is Eastern India. Um, so southwest of Bangladesh uh, and sort of northeast of uh, Hyderabad, which is right in the center of India. So sort of east, northeast, central part of mainland India. So not the northeast of India. So various claims about uh, Sora in the past. So it has been claimed various things about Sora. Um, so uh, most famously, a series of papers by Donegan and Stamp and Donegan uh, claimed that uh, Sora was a quantity sensitive trochaic stress system. Um, Ramamurti, who today uh, remains the best description of the language from 1931, um, we're hoping to supersede that in the next year or two, but uh, morphologically conditioned stress was what he claimed. So he said there was a morpholexical conditioning to the stress. So the quantity sensitive trochaic stress pattern has proven to be inaccurate based on instrumental phonetic data. And we're testing the second hypothesis presently. And I'll give you some data to prove the first part in just a second. So a lot of this work is in response to this theory of rhythmic holism that Donegan and Stamp put forward that was uh, an alleged shift from iambic to trochaic word structure at the proto-munda stage which triggered a whole series of typological reorderings and restructurings that allegedly ended up in Munda languages being the mirror image of the Austroasiatic languages of mainland Southeast Asia. Um, so this has been subjected to a critical review in a series of papers by various scholars over the last half a dozen years. And uh, what has been revealed is that there are no acoustic cues of prominence on the first syllable, but rather the second one in Sora disyllables. And this is also true of a number of other Munda languages, uh, Santali, Gata, Remo, and Kutob all seem to pattern this way. Um, those represent the full spectrum of genetic diversity within the Munda language family. And thus the conclusion is that these languages never underwent a shift from biambic to trochaic structure. And therefore nothing in the history of these languages can be explained by a shift that never happened. Okay. So just to give you some of the data on Sora disyllables, um, we have three acoustic cues that are conspiring to trigger or indicate prominence. Um, one is duration. The second is intensity, and the third is fundamental frequency or pitch. And as we can see from these three graphs, the second syllable is always um, more prominent in these three cues 
than the first syllable is in disyllables in Sorrel. Just a little bit of um, pitch um, contours and normalization in a disyllable word. So we see a rise of pitch and a smooth pitch contour of the same. So um, summarizing this, um, Sora has <laughs> trochaic or falling word prosody. Um, uh, it does not have that, excuse me, that is a false. It has rising or iambic structure still. In fact, it retains the old prosodic word patterns within these larger constructs. And it's a, basically a second syllable stress system. It's probably true of most other Munda languages. Um, in the case of Karya, it has been pro proposed that that language instantiates an LH prosody that is L star H. Um, and that at least is plausible with regards to the data with Sora, except for that the, when we look at comparing the vowel qualities of first and second syllables and disyllables, that doesn't support it. Because what we see when we look at this is that first syllables are uh, more centralized um, and less contrastive with, uh, in comparison to second syllables, where you find uh, more peripheral values. And so basically the vowel contrasts are more robust in second syllables than first syllables. So on P words and G words, so it is well known that in morphologically complex languages, what is defined as a word grammatically does not always align exactly with what the prosodic or phonological characteristics of the language would suggest as a word. And I refer to some recent work on this. Um, there's a volume by Bogomoliets and Van der Holst that's about to come out, a recent study by Eichenwald, Dixon and White, which is a revisiting of a former study. Um, so basically, there are some mismatches between P words and G words in such structures. So an example of this would uh, possibly would comes from Santali, which is another Munda language. Here we see what is analyzed as one grammatical word, but may well consist of four lexical or P words, sorry, excuse me, prosodic word. Why is that happening? I'm going to make this work. Why is it not working? Why does it go to that? You had it work. In Gidra Bun Aru Akat Kwa. So we see that there are potentially four disyllabic structures here, um, which are would be four P words. Uh, correlating to this one complex G word in Santali. Also, um, morphotactic distributions of elements can reveal interesting mismatches. So um, what looks like a prefix, uh, a, a possessive prefix in Sora, when you see it in a larger structure, you realize that it's a, a phrasal clitic, um, that it attaches to the leftmost member of the modified noun phrase or possessed noun phrase. So uh, we compare two and three, we see that it occurs, uh, the uh, possessive or dependent marker occurs on the adjective modifying the noun in three, as opposed to the noun itself on two. So just some background on the data. So um, for the verbs, we recorded this in four villages of Assam. Um, these four villages, Singer John, Sessa, Koilamari, and Lamabari. So this was 10, uh, people in each village, five male, five female speakers. Um, and for the nouns, we recorded uh, in two villages in Orissa, um, two male and two female speakers with no formal education, all in their 50s. Um, and all of the uh, speakers are represented in the data we'll be showing now. So on the actual data that we recorded, we recorded in three contexts, one in isolation, one in a phrasal frame that's given in four, nian blank gam lai, I blank said, and in an out of focus frame where you're focusing, triggering focus on another element in the sentence. So nian blank akara gam lai dirga ija. So I said blank uh, loudly, not softly um, or forcefully. So the data was recorded in the field with the Head-mounted unidirectional microphone, the Tascam, 
and that's the technical specs there. Okay, so talking to the nouns, um, there's two types of noun structures here um, that we'll be looking at. Um, and what we're, you need to know about Sora is that every noun occurs in two forms. One, a syntactically freestanding form that's typically disyllabic and a um, morphologically bound, typically monosyllabic combining form. And these are related to, um, relatable to the free forms by various derivational processes. So the base form is the combining form and the free form is a, is a derived form. And this can be derived through infixation, uh, as in six, through reduplication, as in seven, through prefixing, as in eight, or through compounding with another uh, combining form, uh, as in nine. And so in the graphs I'll show you here, we'll refer to the form in eight as the combining form in final position. And um, in nine, that is the combining form that originates in or finds itself in a free form in initial position just to see if that had any difference in the data, okay. Um, all right, so in turning now to the trisyllabic nouns, what we find is uh, with respect to duration uh, that we find a convergence in either the second or third syllable. So in isolation and in the unaccented or unfocalized form, we see it on the second syllable, but a peak of duration on the third syllable in the phrasal or sentential frame. Um, a slightly different pattern emerged with the compounds that had the combining form and final form. Here we find um, in isolation uh, on the third syllable, but on the second syllable, uh, the peak in duration uh, in the phrasal and in the unaccented uh, contexts. Um, with regards to intensity, we see a very clear and consistent second syllable peak across this uh, all, all of these forms. So whether it's the initial combining form forms or the final combining form forms, we find very clear evidence of peak in intensity on second syllables. Fundamental frequency um, shows a similar distribution. That is, we find it in isolation on the second syllable, that is the penultimate, but in the final syllable in the phrasal and the unaccented context. So it seems like it might be serving as a, a um, marker of utterance or something. And when the, uh, that is the, the pitch declination goes back one syllable when, when it's in isolation, so as an utterance phenomenon. Um, we basically find similar data when we look at the uh, final combining form. So second syllable in, in isolation and final syllable in um, the other two contexts. Just a, example of a three syllable noun here with the smooth pitch corner you can see it rises basically not trochaic <laughs> so, um, so now turning to four syllable forms here we see uh, with regards to duration again um, either in the isolation and the um, phrasal context we find final position as the peak of duration, but the second position when it's in an unaccented frame. Um, intensity is fairly consistent, which we saw with the nouns peaking on the second syllable. So, And um, thirdly, we have the fundamental frequency. And here we see the same type of pattern we saw before, either on the penult or ultimate syllable, depending on the different contexts. So turning now to the verbs briefly, um, just a brief uh, structural indication of what Sora's verb is like. You see it has a somewhat polysynthetic structure with up to two prefix slots and nine suffixal slots. They aren't typically, they're never all uh, filled basically, but you can get some pretty long words and it's very common to have five morphemes or something in a, in a verb. So anyat jant linai, we caught the snake. So in the verbs, we're finding a very consistent pattern here. So duration uh, in trisyllabic verbs very clearly is on the final syllable. Intensity, uh, as we would expect by now, is in the second position. Intensity is a very robust cue in the second position of, of Sora as a marker of promise. 
And fundamental frequency as well is, is peaking on the second syllable in the trisyllabic verbs. The four syllable verbs are showing similar uh, patterns. So in the duration Q, what we find is final duration is, is, the, is the peak. Again, intensity is peaking on the second syllable in the four syllable verbs. And also like intensity, fundamental frequency is peaking on the second syllable as well. Okay, so what do we have here? What we have is first that all disyllabic words in Sora have prominence on the second syllable cued by a conspiracy of duration, intensity, and fundamental frequency. The preliminary data on both nouns and verbs suggest that three and four syllable forms, at least, we have basically coterminous structures between prosodic and grammatical words. So up to four syllables, at least, the grammatical words seem to function as prosodic words. There's a single peak. Um, and within that, the cues uh, vary in the robustness of signaling prominence. Uh, so that intensity is the most consistent cue across all of the forms. Uh, and this is found on the second syllable. Duration, oh, once we go beyond the second syllable, seems to actually be uh, perhaps functioning to delimit word boundaries. So there's a lengthening of the final syllable of the word um, because it shows a pattern that's rarely on the second syllable when you have more than two syllable words. Um, now, fundamental frequency is found on the penultimate syllable in four syllable forms, which may reflect a general drop in pitch in the final syllable of a word boundary, but it's final in three syllable forms. So that's not consistent, and we still must find an explanation for this. Um, but we're in the process of collecting a much larger data set that we hope uh, will verify or exclude these options that we're proposing here. Um, now with the verbs, we've seen that they are quite morphologically complex. And so far we've limited ourselves to, just to the four syllables, but we have now collected a, a, a range of data from a number of speakers that correlate to other um, syllable structures, five, six, seven, eight. And what we're trying to figure out is in this case is whether some of the comments that Ramamurti made are, are tenable, like are, are there actual morphological conditionings? Do certain morphemes attract or deflect stress? So we're still, that's, that's still out. The question is still out on that, but we're, we're tentatively, it seems at least with the four syllable, up to four syllables, we have a good correlation between P words and G words. Um, I suspect that once we get into the larger, more marked morphological structures that we will actually find some mismatches between the P words and G words, but you know, who knows, we'll see that. Um, and we're going to try to figure out um, whether there are both intensity um, and particularly fundamental frequency peaks that are correlated to these morphemic um, things. The, the duration really seems to, to be a different phenomenon that works on a word boundary level. And then the next steps will be to analyze these five to eight syllable words that we've been collecting. And um, Luke just returned from a, uh, field trip yesterday. So he's got some fresh data in his hands and we'll be working through that in the next uh, few weeks or months. So, and then hopefully we'll be able to fully determine whether we have mismatches or um, coterminous relations between the P words and G words in this relatively complicated language of, of India uh, belonging to the Munda family that we call Sora. Thank you for listening.